Well, Brian, as long as nobody tells. Like, well, oh, there, no, but, but still, it feels funny. And I don't know how, like, I'm supposed to lie it's to a my big parents. Property. You can hide a lot of stuff there. Uh, well, I mean, okay. Uh, 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 how, how hard is it? They weren't in season, right? I don't know where they would be in season. Kenya well, it is weird. I mean, I, I, what do I say to the furry guy? Well, good luck in your next life. Thank, yeah, yeah. Way, way, way to assume gender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, first of all, guy, I insist, is a gender neutral term. It's named after Guy uh, uh, Fox. So it is a person. It is, it Brian, is a... say that to yourself as you're carrying your box of things out the front door. Of the <laughs> oh my God! Mm-hmm. Is this it? Am I am I finally being? Uh... Yep. HR call. Yep. Brian. HR is here. Thank God. And uh, they have uh, some strong words for you. I'm I'm finally a victim. Mm-hmm. Nope. And by HR, I mean a huge rhino. <laughs> Do you remember <laughs> when they did the Twitter layoffs and they talked to? Uh, the guy Ligma. Yeah. Wait, wait, what? There was a they did that there was an interview with like two Twitter guy, two Twitter people who've been laid off and they're holding their stuff in front of the Twitter offices. And it was a prank because one was called himself Ligma for like Ligma, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I met him, I know him. Um he he uh it was funny because he was basically worked at a gym, was working out rather at a gym next door and saw that like news crews had gathered because like the whole Twitter layoffs under Elon. So he called his buddy and they ran and grabbed a bunch of boxes full of stuff and went out there to pretend they're Twitter employees. That's amazing. And then we're like, we just got laid off. What's your name? Like, mom, <laughs> like, okay, like, you know, and so it just became such a, you know, funny sort of meme of like the press immediately ready to talk to somebody who got let go. And these guys just show up like, oh yeah, we were let go. We yeah. Let go. Yeah. That was yeah. Really rough. Uh, That's amazing. That, uh, was, that was the first mistake is assuming that somebody actually worked in office. Yeah. Exactly. Actually worked like full stop. I walked by uh, the Google offices in SF and uh, it was a big protest outside, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's like, meanwhile, they got all these little other satellite offices. I met with somebody from Google at a completely different location and we're walking by. There's all these people in front of Google and he's like, yeah, that's that's the office I didn't go into today. Yeah. Yeah, downtown SF is such a weird scene now. It used to be so bustling back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, now it's hustling, hustling that fentanyl, Hus- hustling flow, starring yeah. DJ Qualls. Yeah. All right, are we feeling it? I've never yep. felt it more. Uh, well, uh, that's inappropriate, and you're gonna report to HR. Okay, yeah. huge rhino. Here I come. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, uh, Andrew, talk for just a wee bit. I'm talking for just a wee bit here. <laughs> now you see why I didn't become a professional actor. Okay. All right. Here we go. Take us in. In three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Ahoy, ahoy. And Mr. Justin Robert Young. Wee. Good day, my lady. Yeah, gentlemen. Well, I took your advice and I went ahead and I bought the Bamboo A1 3D printer. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Andrew, the last time that we talked about this, you said you have a lot of very important projects that you're working on and that Brian, you were... Justin, cut yeah. the camera to me. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> a switchblade 3d printed knife just came out oh my god what's hilarious Check. about this is that i was literally on the phone with andrew yesterday afternoon as he was pulling this out of the packaging so within the last uh uh i mean certainly less than 24 hours like the the, the last 20 hours he has 3d printed a uh a pocket knife a stiletto uh, cut to the camera back here all right uh oh also oh my god <laughs> <laughs> also, he's 3D printed one of those things where you pull it, the gears turn, and a, 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 a whirly gig just goes flying off. <laughs> uh, the quality on these prints is, this is the Bamboo A1 printer right now, which, by the way, um, 
we talked about before because I, I had lamented to anybody who would listen, which is not a very long list, about how bad three repenters still were over a decade after they were supposed to have their moment. And Bamboo has their uh, the A1, the A1 Mini. And what's nice about them is they are uh, it was not a paid promotion. Um, you can buy the whole printer with, by the way, you'll notice this is printed. This was all printed at once. What? Black, white, so, and so, blue. Uh, for audio listeners, we have uh, 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 three different uh, colors of resin in there. Yeah, and so the filament, so it, it basically, the print was cool, is what it did is it went and it printed the blue thing on one part of the print plate, then went and printed the black part, the spring, and then printed the blade on another part, all at once, right? And so it took 45 minutes, which in 3D print world, like... That's like 11 that's seconds, lot. yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is a huge speed up. So, I mean, that was, you know, 45 minutes to make a thing with a spring mechanism like that was insane. That printer, by the way, was on sale complete. It has this, the printer, and it has this device that has the four different colored filaments that feeds into it. The whole thing, 500 bucks. Damn. Wait, uh, uh, the, the whole thing that created everything you just showed us was 500 bucks yep. total? Out yep. the door. Like, Out the door. Wow. Yeah, so it's been the quality you're getting now at this price is insane. They have a smaller version, which is on sale for like, if you just want to do one filament, they have a smaller one that's like two hundred bucks. Damn! But, but really, the, the, the 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 magic is in the uh, is in is in the multiple filaments, right? Like that's that that's that's what makes this yeah. thing special. Yeah, Brian, I'm sending you the link if you want to just take a look at this, and the. It's a toy. I, I mean, I got it to sort of play around with, but also the fact that one of the pivots I've been seeing, a lot of people in AI are now getting into hardware. A lot of some people at OpenAI and some other people are now getting very interested in the idea of what can we do in the physical world now that we have a lot more intelligence, a lot more systems. And this this knife was great, great because somebody thought out there's a, at Brigham Young University, there's an entire lab that studies what they call compliant mechanisms, which are basically like solid one piece mechanisms that have multiple actions like pliers and other kinds of tools that you can 3D print, because also they're useful if you want to make things at a very tiny scale, too. I think with Mark Rober, they did an experiment where they, they built like a tiny Nerf gun that is like, you know, extremely, extremely small, like like fit on, you know, the tip of a Q-tip. But uh, yeah, this is the printer. And so that's that's the whole the whole setup there, as you can see. That's got the four different spools that are controlled by motor, the print, all that. Like it's just insane. How, you know, how fast is it? And by the way, the link is uh, store dot b a m b u l a b bamboo lab dot com. Yeah, b yeah bamboo is in with you. Yeah, um, like this was forty five minutes to print this. Which Get if out. you're familiar with three D printing, you know. We're seeing your whole screen, Brian. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you you can see all the Instagram spam that's showing up. <laughs> I know. It should, it, there should be an automatic block on Twitter. Anything that starts with Instagram, just block. Just block that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I opened up. Uh, th thank you for <laughs> letting me know. <laughs> no. no problem. So anyhow, I think that we're going to see these effects in other places because when you start building robotics machines and other kinds of tooling, it's, it's pretty cool. There's been a resurgence in South LA, in uh, Southern California, rather, uh, in the El Segundo. They call it the Gundo, which is a new area. Well, it's always oh, been there for a long time. Yeah. But the whole, you have SpaceX there. You have, you know, Andrews in Orange County, which is the fence manufacturer. There's robotics companies. You know, somebody told me that they said, yeah, like if you want to get a part machined, you know, over day, overnight, there are 24 hour machine shops there. Which you just, which is insane, and if you because there's so much, fast. there's so much explosion in that in that field. With the idea being that AI can provide something that like require will will be unlocked by custom hardware, yeah. and now and now the, these machines are cheap enough, and and we have experience enough with them that it's its own cottage industry, and you're getting. There's really interesting stuff in machine learning of taking scans of objects and then making uh, meshes to print them from. So you take an object like this. This is an iPhone stand, right? And so you're, this entire device, even probably the mechanism for holding clamping it, if you used a, a compliant mechanism, could probably you could 3D print now. You could yeah. 3D print the whole thing. Now, 
thing is, what what's 3D printing is great for is making a few of a thing. When you want to make a lot of a thing, you know, the, the company, the 3D printer they send you, you know, they don't 3D print the parts on there because, you know, they're making a thousand of these at a time. So it's more cost effective to do that. But I bet you most of the parts were prototyped. I bet you, you know, the, the yeah. prototype phase. And for certain smaller runs of things, you know, I made a magic trick a long time ago that I barely made money on because it's just, you know, the print overages and whatnot. But today, if I were to produce the same thing, I'd make a much bigger profit using more state-of-the-art printers. Well, and uh, at what point do we cross a threshold where it's a bad idea to even bother to make it at your own house and then ship it through USPS to, to deliver it? At what point does the general populace become aware it's like, okay, I could wait three days for this to show up in the mail or I could print it myself. Like at what point do, do we have that uh, permeation? So one of the first things I made on the printer was the printer, because it can, it, it, it's very good at cleaning the filaments. Like it's amazing watching the process because it starts off, it makes sure the bed is level. There's none of that calipers and stuff you used to have to use. And then it has to wipe away the filament that it has. And it has a scraper a device that goes over to scrape across and remove the excess filament. Well, that uh, just drops it onto the floor. So I needed a bucket for that. And so I just found a 3D print for a bucket for that. And <laughs> ran it through the printer. And then, you know, after a few hours, I had my my bucket to put the excess materials in there. So let me see if I can find... Yo, um, dog, I heard you like 3D printers. So I've used a 3D printer to 3D print a bucket to get the excess from your 3D printer. So right now I've got a video of... It's that was probably that's a video from when it was printing the bucket bucket. It should update. Now you can see it's printing another 3D, another knife. OK. Yeah. And so it does. It'll do time lapses. So there's a camera. But like it's incredible. Oh, you get wait, the wait, so, so the camera's built into oh. it. Like they know yeah. that one thing everybody who 3D prints anything loves is to have a video well, of it well, being not, made. Not, not, not only loves, but also what they hate the most is that they start a 3D print. And then for whatever reason, something goes wrong and, and they don't know why uh, well and and it's like just screwed and so like andrew yeah. a, a, andrew mentioned 45 minutes is the fastest that anyone's 3d printed anything that complex ever uh so a lot of these things are you know uh, pushing into 10 12 25 hours you know depending on, on on the complexity of stuff so the peace of mind of being able to know if this got screwed i need to restart I can restart now because I have the peace of mind that this thing went bad as opposed to just the next time you happen to wander by and it's like, oh, well, this thing has been screwed. I've wasted filament. I've wasted time. Uh, uh, this is this is bad. That That's a really, really, really smart creature comfort. And they, they put in some simple AI in there. So if let's say you get like the spaghetti where it starts missing and spooling out all over, the AI is supposed to flag that and tell you if there's a problem with the filament. Let's say it's pulling that you run out of filament. If you have the same color filament on there, it'll just switch to the other spool. Oh, wow. wow. So you can, if you want to do a really complex print, you just put four spools of the same colored material on there and then it will run through them. If you get a snag or some sort of like, you know, error, it will pause the print and you can often fix it, which you could never do before with like, you know, the original printers. The idea that you could actually recover a print and keep going. The one, the one example I saw somebody said they had a problem with was uh, it. They had a power, their power shut down, and the printer could pick up after the power put shut down. But the problem was, is the plate had started to cool down, mm. and so the the plate had cooled down, and then that used to lose adhesion. But I mean, those are minor sorts of things. And and if you think about when you're talking about a printer that if you just wanted to print one color, you know, a three hundred fifty dollar printer. If you were doing a print farm where you just do like if you're doing multiple, you know single parts at a time, it's insane. But when you see the multicolor printing, some of the multicolor prints are really, really, really amazing what you can do with some of these different new materials. There, there is uh, aesthetically something primal to just like, these are spools of plastic and they get fed into the thing. And it's like, it's so simple that everybody can grasp it. It occurs to me recently there was an episode of the Modern Rogue where we talked about uh, uh, my parents would buy books that just had page after page of basic programming. And I would sit there and I would type it all in and then be able to play Mancala afterwards and so on. It occurs to me that, that the next generation that's coming up right now, 
50 years from now will be able to roll their eyes and say, uh, I remember when in order to 3D print a thing, you had to actually look at the physical spools to go in. Uh, I guess that's a long way to get to the question of what do you think 3D printing looks like 30, 40, 50 years from now? Well, I think in that time frame, you know, we, we are probably doing molecular assembly or something. It's going to be a, you know, tank full of proteins or whatever they're going to make. Which yeah. You want. That soon? Oh. Build me a new arm. 50 years? Yeah, I guess so. 50 years. Yeah. Like, like, like if I, if I go back 50 years in computing, 50 years ago is what? Uh, 1975. Uh, so, so that's Voyager uh, era uh, computation. Um, we've, we've come a fair bit from then. You yeah, think? we have the thing we have to account for, too, is the acceleration that AI gets into this, because, you know, we we are and we'll talk about, you know, one of the, the new thing coming out of Anthropic, the Claude three sonnet. But, you know, when you put a print farm in there and I have a bunch of data and I have it going to uh, an AI system and I'm trying to figure out, you know, the, the term again, compliant mechanisms, which are really helpful if you make them on a micro scale. So this device, this the switchblade would work on a microchip. You know, if you look at what an airbag sensor looks like, you know, it's actually very similar to that sort of springy kind of mechanism. When you get into this area where we're now getting AIs that understand mesh mechanisms, you know, we're getting AI that understand 3D structures. And so when you start thinking about the accelerations that happen there, when I can run a thousand experiments and have a GPT-4 level AI monitor the success and outcome of that, you just get a rapid advancement in knowledge. Yeah, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> I I know sooner or later we're gonna divert into AI talk, so it's I'm gonna hold off on what I was gonna say. Have you seen the three? The whole there are companies now that do 3D printed shoes. Uh, go on. So they do because there's a lot of these different filaments that like some are flexible, some are you know have like you know, durability like. You could you could print your own Crocs with a thing like that, and I don't know why you'd want to. I but, was about to say, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, there's a let me see, there's a a brand called uh, Fused Footwear, um, FusedFootwear.com. Okay, <laughs> and you can see their crazy shoes. And there we go. I've got a, it up on the. Oh my god, it's 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 like a if, if a cyber truck was a, oh, a low damn. poly shoot boot, then yeah, yeah. It's like like when when you look at the way Kanye West dresses, and you're like, uh, too subtle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too subtle. But uh, I see this becoming a thing. Oh, I don't man. doubt it. I mean, especially for high fashion, if you're if you have the right sway and you have the right marketing. You can sell it at a premium because fashion is something that is sold at a premium. Uh, but also, you could have the option to do it a little bit cheaper because of the way that you're printing it. Oh man, I I, I guess I'll text this to the. Fa I mean, uh, how much would we spend on five pairs of shoes? What if we just printed all our shoes from now on? Uh, yes, everyone will make fun of us and we'll get beat up at the bus stop. But I'll I'll. It'll be a wash. I can now justify this bamboo. So there's, you know, kind of a, what's interesting about the 3D printing is you're, you're, after you buy the printer, your cost is effectively your materials. And there's a company or somebody selling a very interesting tool head for a 3D printer where it lets you use, because all, all plastic, every piece of plastic you had around you started off as pellets mm -hmm. and then yeah. you melt the pellets. And so even the 3D filament, that made this was at one point pellets that then got melted into the filament, which has a pretty, you know, the part of what helps is making sure the filament has a very high tolerance. But if you just buy the pellets directly, your cost is like 15, 20%. And, and I see that as being a thing where you just load up a bunch of colored pellets into a thing and, you know, you're going to pay for, and this was, I explored this as a business years ago, which was basically a Netflix for 3d prints. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea that what you're really going to, what you're really trying to sell people is just reliability of knowing the print's going to work. And so the way you price a thing isn't per, per, isn't per, you know, device you make, it's going to be, you know, basically for access to a catalog that lets you print things. Because right? you are selling quality control. You are, yeah, you are exactly. selling uh, the, the, the curation. 
yeah, and if you do that, you you know you could get you could incentivize people to because like you know Bamboo Labs, you know I paid their filament prices. Are, I use the, they. What's neat about their filament, by the way, is they have an RFID chip in there. So when you load it onto that machine, it spins it around, loads it, and it knows what color filament it is. Wait, uh, so, like, uh, so 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 all of the when you say the filament, you mean all of the filament, or like the beginning of a filament spool, or. The spool itself has an RFID chip in it. Got it, it right? got it. So the the, so, the actual thing that the filament is wrapped around uh, yeah, if you look it at self the, identifies. The, the, yeah, if you look at the the device that connects to that holds the filament, when it spins it around, there's an RFID sensor in there and it looks and says, Oh, this is yellow filament number twenty two, so we gotta use this profile for it. That's just, great. Yeah, super smart. It just you felt like this feels like a feels like a third generation printer. Well, and and not just it's not just smart in the ability to say wrong things, sir, but also to say like, okay, here's what we can and can't do with this. We recommend that you, you know, we can offset the problems with this filament, you know, and and this will be constantly updated with uh, firmware updates and so on. But it's like, uh, uh, okay, we notice that you use this one. It it has this uh, uh, plasticity problem uh, that can be offset with this other filament. Why don't you buy more of blank, and then that way we could still use this other thing. So somebody put in the I don't know if you clicked on this. Check on Cheech SP's link. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Cheech. By the way. Uh, uh, oh my God! All right. So somebody has sent us a uh, Reddit link. Uh, Justin, describe to everybody what we're looking at right here. I never thought I'd see the day, folks. It is a pink and yellow croc being 3D <laughs> printed. <laughs> That's awesome. This is at uh, uh, Bamboo Lab, uh, the subreddit. That's awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Just in time for so pride. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's using an enclosed one. So for some of those materials, like materials like that, you might want, you might not, you might not get the same, you might not get as much success using the open air printer like I have. So their enclosed systems are about, they're like a thousand dollars. But you but know, you now, can do well, like some for real, for real stuff. Like you can print a crock in in yeah. uh, a closed version, huh? Yeah. Damn. So so when when you're buying filament, uh, Andrew, Brian, all the crocs you can print. <laughs> you, you know this is this is at your fingertips. You can just be printing crocs all day. Hey kids, guess <laughs> what? Uh, birthdays, uh, Christmases, Arbor Day, Bot Flag mitzvahs. Day, croc croc croc. So uh, uh, do do they? Like when, I'm on the Nile. <laughs> when, That's what I'm sending you, crocs, baby. <laughs> Toothy grin. Better when, watch out, because Brian's slinging Crocs. When you, a Croc of what? Well, Crocs. When you when you buy Betty Crocker, <laughs> that's Brian's nickname. Well, he's slinging these Crocs. When start you, a GoFundMe, because this man needs to be filling up all of our stockings with Crocs. Throwing Crocs like he's a strong man at a weird circus that gets its license revoked. That's what he's going to be. When? Not an alligator. Different. It's a Croc. All right. All right. When when Justin runs subroutine other show. <laughs> yeah. um, the uh, uh, Andrew, uh, when you buy the filaments, I understand that color, of course, will be a factor. But do they classify like flexibility or uh, uh, stretchiness or rubberiness or any of those things? Yeah, there is entirely different categories. Like those shoes we're using, I think what's called a TPU, which is a different material. Um, and that's why like that shoe looks almost like it was just somebody just put a shoe inside of a 3D printer. It just looks like that. Yeah. That stuff just sticks to the build plate really well. So yeah, you get different kinds of filament based on what you're trying to do in different 3D printers. Like I said, the one that I have probably wouldn't be able to print that shoe because it's uh, an open air printer. Um, but you know, other kinds of thrillment, you know, it just depends. Like I'm using just PLA, so, which is the kind of the safest, we, uh, easiest one to work with. We we touched on this uh, a little bit before. Um, let, let's say, you know, somebody essentially just hears the words about $500, 3D printer. Where do they go to get the, uh, <clears throat> as as the Joker once said about uh, uh, Gotham's greatest hero, where, does, where do you get these wonderful toys? 
What do you mean? I mean, uh, where, where do you, where where do you, do you go to thing? download where do you buy the things? It? Yeah. No, no, no. The I mean, wait, 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 where do you go to find the, the good prints? Makerworld.com. What? So Makerworld so is Makerworld.com. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's there's many of them. There's Thingiverse, whatever, but Bamboo Labs has Makerworld plugged in. So this is my app for monitoring my print, right? Okay. I can clip on models, and all of a sudden, I'm taken to a catalog of models to mm. print. And let me see if I get Smart. that Smart. I can find a thing that I like, and I can just click it, send to printer. And it works better than my damn Canon printer. Wait, so printer. so so you could do this like you could be out at a brew pub meeting somebody, and they're like, "This is the uh, As I ni do. nice shoes." And then you can, while you're out and about, just click a button and say, "Send to printer." And when you get home, you'll have those shoes. Assuming my print plate is cleared and doesn't have anything on there, absolutely. And I would assume that your printer, with the camera and AI, will know if your print plate's empty, right? Yeah, yeah, yep. So yeah, you can you can just I I started like you know one of the prints you know from the other room. I'm like, oh, I want to I want to build a thing, and so I just was in the other room and said, okay, go ahead, click print, and it went to start printing it. And uh, just, that is awesome, and yeah. uh, I I I literally there are a bunch of jokes I want to make. However, uh, the proof is in the pudding. You should not, Brian. Don't make any jokes because it's not a joking matter that everybody should go to patreon.com slash weird things. Patreon.com slash weird things. What's this? Very seriously. Don't type with any kind of crazy finger movements. Type it straight down the middle. Patreon.com slash weird things. It's where you support this show. I'm sorry. I accidentally I, I went to patreon.com slash weird things. Be serious. Brian, it's not a joke. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you support independent podcasting like this. Head on over there right now and make sure that you get on the team. Patreon.com slash weird things. Big week in AI, uh, which we can say every week. I was every about to say, I was about to say. Day. <laughs> is that the sound of somebody breathing that I just heard? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, yes, yeah. Yesterday on Twitter, I see Anthropic dropping a little teaser with a Morse code and a uh, a little key that they had that, that that you had to break for it. And then the, I went out for a walk, and apparently they had unveiled it in in the in, in the intervening time. Uh, and that is a new model, a new Claude model, huh? So they unveiled Claude Sonnet, which Sonnet was like in their their model tiers. They have HiQ Sonnet. And then Opus and Sonnet's like they're kind of middle tier, but they just dramatically improved Claude Sonnet, and uh, and some evals appears to be better than GPT four O in some tasks. Damn. They also created uh, a, and I'm I'm all about giving credit where credits due. They also created kind of a very cool thing called Artifacts, which is I'll do a demo here. If you guys, let me see if I can share this. With you. Uh, um, meanwhile, like uh, so. Uh, Anthropic is funded by which company? Uh, it has money Anthropic. from Amazon. Yeah, okay. yeah, they 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 have funding from all over. They initially had a half a billion of money from FTX. Uh, oh, or some <laughs> yeah. How did that work but, out? Uh, they, well, I mean, they they actually that 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 investment turned out to be worth something. So you know, I think they're a highly capable company. They build great models. A um, let's see, I'm going to create a. Plat a 2D platformer with a ghost that I control and dodge. So I noticed lightning. that you're not specifying what language or anything. You just sort of just 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 threw it out there. Yeah, I'll let it do what it's you know, let it let it figure out what language it wants to do. So what they have is a a thing so, called artifacts, which what it will do is that it will basically, and I may need to told it to do that, but it, it's, it's generating this and you can see it's writing the code on the right. It, it and, selected the platform. It says, uh, oh, you want a game? And and that that's one of those little, uh, uh, I don't know, tidbits that I find a lot of people find counterintuitive with AI prompts is like the less specific you are, the more freedom it has to just give you what you want, the better off you are. Like in this case, you said, you didn't say, 
open a JavaScript prompt or whatever, uh, you, you said, I want a game, and it decided to make it out of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Yeah. So it gave me, I have my lightning bolts, I have a white screen, but I can't see the ghost. So I'm going to say, I can't see the ghost, use emoji and make the background black. So this is also, and we've talked about this, this might be a little bit of more after things talk, but we've talked about how having an AI is very familiar to anybody who's been a boss or a manager or a director where you just sort of wave your hands and explain what you want and then things uh, get either closer or farther away from your vision. So uh, uh, that's extraordinarily impressive that you're able to be so loosey-goosey in your language. Okay, so where are we at now? We got it, we got it, uh, okay. Uh, like, audio you listeners, you're, ghost, you're, yeah. you're seeing uh, an emoji of a ghost side scrolling to the right with a bunch of yellow letter eyes, essentially. It looks a little bit like ASCII art. And so uh, the, yeah. the new prompt is add points, make the ghost bounce up and down, use physics, and uh, that's literally all he typed. So we are now three prompts in, and we have a side-scrolling thing, and I would imagine that from here you can add, like, put a life meter, deduct one point every time yep. the ghost touches one of these, Wow, et cetera, okay, et and so that, 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 that's what the artifact thing is, is that it's just running it right next to it? Runs where... the code that I told it to, yeah. Wow, that's cool. And uh, we can do that, too, if you're working on a document. I'll show you how that works, but so now, click on that screen, um, boom. Oh, I can't control the ghost. What happened? There we go. There we go. Boom, boom. Oh, it, are, are you hitting the space bar or what? Uh, I'm, I'm hitting the, my up arrow. So every time I hit hit it and I hit a ghost, then I get points. So you could just see, you could clearly, we, we went from three prompts to be able to create a That's thing like this. That's right? remarkably fast. Okay, yeah. so uh, how, how does one sign up for Anthropic? Uh, well, after you have an open AI subscription, then I will out. You just go to anthropic.com or claude.ai. Okay. That's uh, amazing. Uh, let me let me see if I can do that. C L A U D E dot A I. Okay. So I'm there now, and I guess I'll uh oh, I guess I'll sign in with Google. Why not? This is this is our new our new bit is Brian signs up for everything and and uh Andrew explains to him what he's doing. So here I asked it to write a screenplay, and so on the right side of the screen it's created a format, a form of a screenplay. It's using kind of like a markdown format. So what's nice is you can iterate on the thing to the right, which I think it's a really, really good capability. Um, something somebody I know at a certain AI company <laughs> argued for for years. But. Uh, so uh, uh, how, how would you say that Claude compares with uh, OpenAI's work at this point, like, and I don't mean in quality because like th this is not a binary better than less than like in terms of flavors. Well, one of the things Anthropic, I think rightly focused on was language and the idea of how do you use language and how do you write well? And I think that their models write really well. I think that they, they have a better grasp. I don't think they're like I don't think they necessarily generalize about writing better, but I think they use better examples. Although expect the OpenAI ones to get really good really fast. Um, so their capabilities, I think, you know, now probably, you know, um, a lot of people like this model. I think it's price wise. I think it's the same as GPT-40. GPT-40 though has a lot more capabilities when it comes to like the end end voice and whatnot. But for many of the tasks you're going to want to do, you know, this is probably going to be perfectly fine. And so um, we just, I just said, I gave it one line, create a maze game with a vampire theme. Yeah. And uh, I'm Brian, you want to go back to the moon? The, the oh, oh, uh, back to Andrew. Yeah. There we go. Uh, Oops. Oh, so it's, are you the moon or the vampire? I am the believe <laughs> I'm the skull. 
<laughs> no, I think I'm the moon. Yeah, I'm the moon. I'm the moon. But that was that was online. I can just give it like you know, um, use a vampire mosey. So this is interesting. So the nomenclature of Claude three point five makes me think of Chat GPT three point five, which is not as smart nearly as four point oh and on. Uh, but Claude three point five, I should set my brain to about a smart. It is, that is now the the state of the art of uh, the Claude sonnet models. And so, uh, and it, yeah, it actually outperforms Opus in some ways. Yeah. So, it's, oh wow, it's, uh, which which means that we're probably going to see an Opus three point five, which yeah. will be even more capable. I mean, uh, that, that clearly, yeah. You know, and and, and what's interesting is, as you mentioned, four point is something that, uh, at least in by OpenAI's own demonstration, is really something that sings with its app that has yet to be released. And, and and the model itself has been very, very capable, but, uh, you know, what it can do in terms of how fast it is and how good multimodal it is, it's, it's something that uh, uh, I think we've kind of yet to see it, at least the way that OpenAI demonstrated it on a, on a, on a large scale, which, uh, does, which does make me wonder. I mean, like, OpenAI has been very, very good about just shipping, uh, and I, I will say that this has gone a little bit longer that we have not seen even you know a uh, uh, slow leaking out of, of of the new app uh than i that i thought it was going to be but then again maybe i need to reset my expectations yeah the, the challenge with the new one because of the multimodal capability is going to be a matter of how do you get it to deploy it across you know the 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 disadvantage, open, the advantage OpenAI has, and the disadvantage is OpenAI serves by far as the the most largest provider of these services, and so when they put out a feature, the demand's going to be in the millions, not hundreds of thousands. Uh, yeah, real quick, so, Andrew. Uh, look, look, I, can I just show you the thing though? So sure, sure. One of the things. So I wanted to build a maze. The problem with the maze is that it was building before, as they did, like the first one didn't connect, right? Um, and like this very first one, the door was not connected. And that's because it was probably kind of doing random. So I told it there's a there's a pathfinding algorithm, you know, called A star. And I'm like, oh, we'll use A star to go do this. And so that's where it helps to know a little bit of code and or math. But sorry, Brian, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to ask uh, uh, just now I, I tried, you know, uh, do a side scrolling thing with Justin, Brian and Andrew chasing goblins, spiders and snakes. And it seems to have done it, but it says that Claude does not have the ability to run the code. It generates yet. did not enable in the special features. Okay. So mm. you need to go into your account and then look for, uh, in settings feature. Or? Yeah. Feature preview. Okay. Preview. Yep. Artifacts, click on. Turn it on, Got it. baby. Turn artifacts turn on. Turn it okay. on. And then I close it, and then what? Hit refresh. Yeah, start a new session. Okay. Uh, all right, we'll see. Uh, well, here, let me... Let me copy copy that. Copy floppy. the prompt. Yep. There we go. And so then, uh, I guess what? Uh, uh, click a plus. New. I'm going to yeah, start new, a new, new one. New I'm gonna thing. I'm going to paste that right in. It says here, uh, whoa, dear... I copied the wrong thing. Oh, no. Everything's screwed up. I'm a bad person. Welcome to Tech Talk with Grandpa. Uh, there we go. Let me copy the right thing this time. Create a side-scrolling page depicting Justin, Andrew, and Brian chasing a bunch of uh, character creatures, including snakes, spiders, and goblins. Going to click plus on that. Going to paste this in. All right. Claude 3.5. Show me what you got. Uh, it's generating everything real time. You can watch it, write the code using HTML and CSS. We'll add some basic animation. And now it's running. Uh, I don't know who's who. Well, that's where you keep prompting, baby. All right. Wow. It's very, very easy to do this stuff. Uh uh, I, I guess I'll just prompt uh, keep the three main characters uh, characters in the leftmost third of the screen 
keep the creatures in the rightmost third of the screen, and it auto-completed that part, um, add uh, a starry night background. Okay, so now, uh, I can't believe I'm two prompts in, I'm already this far. So it's generating right now, we're watching it create the real-time script, a uh, bunch of HTML is happening. Uh, it definitely restated back to me everything correctly. And now there's a chase scene. It's still scrolling. Uh, uh, now I'm gonna get short. I'm gonna say main characters should look human and be running. So when you, the thing you have to think about is when you say look human, it's gotta figure out how it's supposed to do that. And if you say use emoji, then it goes, oh, I'm gonna use emoji. But if you say look human, it might be thinking, oh, do I have, you know, do I have access to some 3D assets or some GIFs or something like that? So you really want to work within the scope of what the system can do. Yeah, I, I phrased it loosey-goosey right now. I said uh, uh, characters should look human, camera should be panning, which maybe is a mistake. Well, we're about to find out. Okay, well, we do have the starry background. Um, uh, yeah, I wonder... I. Well, okay, all right. I, I I don't want to get all the way into tech support, but already this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Your ability to build tools and everything else, it's very cool. So meanwhile, um, we had a couple video generators drop this week, and we had uh, La Luma Dream. La Luma Studio. Luma Dream Booth. Um, let me get the name right. Dream Machine. Luma Dream Machine AI, yep. luma-ai.com yeah. is where I'm peeking right now. So uh, uh, here, I'll hit play on their demo video, uh, but we're, we're looking at, uh, I don't know, a bunch of things happening. Uh, tell me about this. So yeah, what website are you on? Uh, luma-ai.com. And uh, uh, try lumalabs.ai. Okay. L U M A L A B S dot A I. Yeah. Okay. So that's the official site. So they've trained their own video generator model that you can sign up right now and you can start creating videos with. Um, I'll go log into my account and show you. Um, and I think they can do really cool videos and some of these other systems. Your Runway ML came out with a cool system. The thing, because people are immediately go like, ah, oh, they're Sora, they're Sora competitors, you know, opening eyes Sora. And the thing that it's clear once you know what to look for it is Sora is a physics simulator. Like the goal of Sora is to simulate physics. And I can give you an example of that where I'm going to go over to open eyes Sora. Let me uh, share my screen here. And I'll show you a really, really key thing to sort of look at, uh, which is um, – when you look at Sora and you go through the examples, you see a lot of like really cool, you know, pretty, you know, images and stuff. When we watch these mammoths, you know, you see that the cloud of smoke and whatnot come up behind them. When we go to a um, uh, Sora is OpenAI's uh, video yeah. engine. Yeah. So, and again, it's a physics simulator. So, if you look at these dogs in the snow, you notice that some of the snow is behaving really well, following, flying across, whatever in slow motion, that's really, really challenging. When you go look at Luma, like I created uh, some stuff in Luma, like I'm like, oh, like show me a light bulb breaking. And- Oh, got it. Just, and, and so what we have is a rough assembly of like, uh, what looks like a YouTuber space and we see motion and something that may or may not be a uh, mallet, uh, depending on where you are in the video and we see shattering glass but we also see a whole light bulb at the end yeah and 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 the 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 shattering effect is very cinematic and impressive like almost like harry potter-esque but it is not realistic in the way that a light bulb would actually shatter yeah and the hammer changes into a completely different object and and it it does like i did like you know cereal falling into it and again you know sora may fell apart but you can see like cereal falling on the floor 
and it does this nice big swooping shot, but the cereal doesn't behave like cereal. There's no bouncing. Uh, There's uh, no physics. In there. Real quick, Andrew, uh, is Sora still not available to the public? No, right? no. Th but this is. You can go to and that's the thing. Bluma Labs is available. Now I did a a like a Blade Runner cityscape flying through here, and it did a really cool cityscape. But That's you'll start to notice when you really look at it, you'll see that the challenge that video generation is going to face is physics. Yeah. Uh, well, what, it seems like Luma right out, out of the gate seems to at least get the gist of what you're trying to yeah, do contextually. You can use it, you know, and, and, you know, to their, to their credit, you know, same with the runway. Like it's, you're able to use it right now. Sora has a much more sophisticated model, but. It's not available. So. Uh, uh, what's that they say? The best camera you can get is the one you have on you. Uh, okay. 100%. Here we go. 100%. Three podcasters running from a goblin and spiders. Uh, not bad. <laughs> it's not bad. Like if yeah. we were going to take the Weird Things podcast and make just a, like a background running image, that's the three of us. Those are the goblin spiders who are chasing us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's, it's the hard part is you just really start to figure out like the steerability and you see like characters morph into other characters and, and, and you realize that like you need a really good intelligence under to do really highly capable for a lot of it. There's a lot of video that this will be perfectly fine for. Well, especially yeah, you know, I mean, like, 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 so for example, uh, I've been doing video versions of the PX3 show and with a very early rudimentary AI text to video engine. I made just this uh, image of a bunch of American flags flying that I have play under the interstitial uh, sound that kind of denotes that one segment's done and another segment is beginning. Uh, now, I could probably have another model come up with 50, uh, uh, 50 prompts for Americana, right? Like things that denote in one second America and then run it through that and get probably 20 really good ones and even if they're a little uncanny valley it's fine for a one second shot uh, uh and boom there we go yeah yeah i mean these things are moving fast and there's going to be other technologies coming to play to make them more steerable and guidable to help you kind of get what you want all right, so uh, the Luma thing says that uh, you can extend it with other stuff. So right now I'm typing down, uh, uh, we, we saw the beginning stuff, which was excellent already, and I wrote, then they encounter a patriotic celebration. So I'll, I'll see whether or not that... Uh, that's really something that's amazing is, is the video and song extension stuff. Like, I... Just keep going. You get it by now. Yeah. <laughs> you know how it goes. What are uh, picks? Yeah, I'll do picks. Uh, I got I got a weird one. Um, I've been out on, on the road, and so like last night, uh, you know, my kids are at that phase where it's like they're kind of like, I don't know, what do you got to pitch us, Dad? And I don't know how we ended up here, but we ended up watching the uh, starring Idris Elba, the Stephen King adaptation of The Dark Tower, which. I started and I warned Penelope. I'm like, look, it's not great. It does in no way encapsulate the excellence of the Dark Tower series from Stephen King. But, uh, but I did. Like, it took us about an hour to get through the first 20 minutes because she wanted to cackle and howl at uh, the flaws in this thing. But I explained, you know, everything from licensing rights to money to like, let's look at the good things. Look at the cinematography. Notice the cyan yellow com combinations, you know, here, look at the golden ratio being used here. Look how there are different languages. Uh, you read the book. So of course you get infinite words to explain things. They don't have that luxury because they're pitching to people who have never read The Dark Tower, but they need to give enough winks to the fans. Notice how they did this thing that means nothing to the casual audience, but secretly is a reference to the fans. Um, and, and around 20 minutes in, she was like, all right, I think I see what you're saying. And then she got all the way into it. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not a great Hollywood movie, it's not a satisfying adaptation of the books, but the way I phrased it to Penny was, imagine you found out that there was a community theater production of The Dark Tower. Would you go see it? 
Uh, the answer is yes. And you would clap very loud for the people who tried very hard. I said, that's what this movie is. So my, my pick is The Dark Tower. And I would say, yeah, give it a try, especially if you have read the books and want to see a community theater representation of everything. The cost hundred million dollars. I know. Yeah. I know. Look, 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 you're, you're not wrong, Andrew. Yeah, uh, yeah. G- 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 I'm with you. I'm with you, but uh, it's a very uh, rich community. <laughs> yeah. It's very, yeah. That is a, there are films where you watch and then, you know, a little behind the scenes, you're like, Oh yeah, they knew it was a flop before the shooting started and they knew, <laughs> but they were like, the studio needed a film that summer. They needed a slot. They needed a thing. And they're like, we already committed the money, and yeah. you know we're gonna just go ahead and make it. And what, then, what are we gonna like, not do this? All right, let's yeah. go. Dead man walking. Yeah, and, uh, there was a, a I think it was a Hollywood Reporter article about the tortured uh, development hell of the Marvel Blade adaptation with Mara Hersha Ali, and uh, they were apparently two months away from shooting a version of Blade that would have taken place in the 1920s, which I think is an interesting idea. Uh, but uh, uh, they wound up pulling it because it was at at the point that Marvel was like, "Oh no, we actually need to make sure that our hits actually hit." hit. Yeah, like, we 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 want to. Yeah, and I feel like Blade wasn't in it a lot, <laughs> and it was just a lot. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, there's apparently been three scripts now, and they've just scrapped the 1920s version. They, apparently, they built the gigantic train set that they are not going to use, and uh, they might try to repurpose for another Disney movie. But uh, yeah, a big, 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 big mess of a movie for uh, you know, hey guys, the Blade. Doesn't have to be that complicated, man. All, all you have to do well, is he's uh, awesome. He has a he has a he has a katana. Slices up these vamps, dog. Uh, four words: Chris Christopherson and uh, tax evasion. That's all you need to have a blade. I I yeah I. It's funny the train thing because yeah, had they delivered on schedule, then cool, we would have had the Mission Impossible train sequence, the Indiana Jones train sequence, and the Blade train sequence yeah. all in the same summer. Hmm. I yeah, I think Brian like. Marisha Ali, I think he's amazing. He's fantastic. Last I saw Wesley Snipes, dude's in shape. Dude is ready. Like, <laughs> like, 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 why are we not getting more Wesley Snipes as Blade? Apparently, also he's out there on Twitter taunting. Uh, 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 he, I yeah. guess, I guess he knew that this was coming. He knew that this article was coming. But on Twitter, like two days before it dropped, he's like, like, ha ha ha. Still can't find the secret sauce with Blade, huh? <laughs> well and plus yeah. also it's like uh going to jail for being confused about tax law is not the most cancelable offense i confused, can think of confused i think he had his own philosophies on tax law that's fine no i, I i'm trying to I, i'm doing well, pro bono work for him and saying I, I, just say you were confused about it well and again i think the thing is is that because that was a different studio like uh, you know Marvel owns the uh, the uh, IP for Blade, but yeah. the other Blade movies, it was like New Line or whoever. So New Line, yeah. I don't know. Like, I think that that may have been if they did a version that was there. Who knows? I just Marvel make it work out. Like we were told, you know, we were never get Spider Man, and we got Spider Man. And yeah, Kevin Feige it, in in the Hollywood Reporter article says that. Uh, and I don't know if this is a new quote or an old quote, but that Blade is very, very important to him uh, because it was the lesson when he was working at Marvel proper before he became, you know, the the studio executive of the decade. Uh, that 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 Blade really taught him a lesson. That Blade was not a very well known character. It it didn't have a tremendous uh, history in in Marvel comics, but yet they made a great movie, and all of a sudden it was gigantic. And he's like, oh, wait a minute, like. We can make a studio based on characters that aren't the characters that we've already sold off. And that was part of the DNA for him saying, like, all right, Iron Man. Guardians. Congratulations. We are beginning with Iron Man, a, a tertiary character that... A, a highly unlikely Marvel uh, hero that would raise, that would lift all boats. Yeah. And uh turns out, uh, you know, he was he was right. Yeah. Uh, I got a pick. Udio. Let's talk AI. My buddy Kevin Ryan was in town. I was trying to show him cool AI stuff. Uh, we uh we we started making songs. 
He was blown away by the quality of Udio. Went home. He has two little girls. Apparently, they will not go to sleep now unless dad makes songs for them on Udio about How- whatever is going through their little girl minds. So uh, that uh, I, I, I highly recommend, if you have not played around with song AI, with music AI, try out Udio. It's really good. I think that their, their UI right now is like at the point where if they start complicating it beyond this, I think it'll get too complicated. But right now, it's, it's comprehensible. And uh, it's it's really really powerful and and uh, uh, the I don't think for my money the vocals are any better on on another uh, AI music generator. They do vocals ex- extraordinarily well. Excellent. My pick is uh, Justin. If I was going to ask you, like. Uh, the the character of that BBC TV series about the dude who travels for time. Um, how do you spell his name? Wait, d- 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 hold on, real quick. Does he travel through time or both time and space? Yeah, yeah, that guy. How would you spell his name? A D O C T O R. I can kind of tell when you started watching Doctor Who by that, because mm. you see. If you go all the way back to the William Hartnell origin of the role, uh-huh. it was Doctor Who. The show was called Doctor Who, who you know, D O C T O R, but the character was D R. Period. Who? Gotcha. Okay. See? Don't you feel stupid? I Don't do. You feel like I do. <laughs> Thank you for bringing this to light. <laughs> what? Mm. what dumb, dumb, dumb. Yeah. Just sad, sad, Just... sad. I mean, it's not like he did a Doctor Who podcast. Fake nerd. No. Fake what, nerd. What is going on? No, uh, I don't know. Um, I was watching the, I decided, I got, I'm like, you know, I need something sort of passively watched before I go to sleep. But I've kind of run out of good stuff to watch. I'm like, I'm going to go back and start at the very beginning of Doctor Who. And so I started to watch the, I got, I signed up for BritBox and the very first episode came up with Doctor Who starring William Hartnell. And then the end the credits, it said, DR period who and I think about how many times I've watched nerds get upset when yeah. you call it you know doctor period who and not spell it out when apparently that was totally legit the whole time that's so, hilarious yeah so I'm glad I shared that with everybody here you're all grateful I know. so so uh, your, yeah, your, yeah. your your pick uh, uh, Andrew's pick pedantics <laughs> exactly well, that's my pick everybody, <laughs> I gotta be honest about that that's his OS uh, <laughs> Yeah, I decided to go way, way, way back and watch some of the, or, you know, the original stories there. And it is very interesting to see, like, how... Because, you know, at the time, it was, like, 1963, whenever it came out, like, you know, we they joke about Doctor Who having no budget, but those first episodes, like, like you you see, like, part of the back of the studio yeah. in the back with some of those well, shots. Uh, th- there's a reason that they <laughs> decided at some point somebody had to make the call which is more valuable blank uh reel to reel tape or this episode of doctor who and they kept deciding blank reel to reel tape which is why i think there are 13 missing episodes of doctor who in the back catalog 97 missing episodes. 97 that's how low budget uh you know what 50 years from now, they're going to talk about our podcast saying, can you believe that the Weird Things podcast didn't save every single episode they've ever done? They would just get up live every single week and just talk? Yeah, they've released some of the missing ones because they had audio. Like, actually, I was listening to, like, one, the Marco Polo thing on uh, uh, Audible because I'm like, what's this? Let me check this out. So, yeah, there are uh, a number of missing episodes, which you know, on our talk of AI, um, they've done like, they've done like cartoon reimaginings of some of these and whatnot. And I'll say like, I think it's cool. It's not like we're, we've lost like great works of science fiction in some cases, but yeah. it is, you know, Doctor Who is iconic and it's one of the most important pieces of sci- sci-fi IP ever. I do think that you will, we're very, not too far away from training an entire all the Doctor Who episodes, you know, in an AI with the scripts, and then taking the scripts for the missing episodes and feeding it into the AI and getting, well, that looks exactly like what it is. Or 
um, the first two episodes was funny is like they actually squashed the format a bit, but there's going to be a lot of cool stuff coming along the way as far as like uh, reconstructing, redoing stuff. We, we've seen some bad AI reconstructions. I think some of the James Cameron AI stuff has not been good, um, but that technology's gotten a lot better. So, so uh, your specific pick is is old Doctor, Doctor Who. Who. Old, okay. school, old, old, old Doctor Who. All right, old Doctor Who. You watch the new Doctor Who? Oh my gosh! Hey, real quick, you you're watching old Doctor Who. Name a few characteristics of old Doctor Who. Just just talk about the character. Curious. Um, uh, depends. Each Doctor kind of had a different personality. Yeah. Mm. Wait, what are the universals among them? Well, Brian, according to the canon now, the official canon, the first one was a woman. So, uh, okay, black woman, according to the new uh, canon. Really? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The new, new canon. The new, the new stuff. The new. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, 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 and I, I'm gonna say it like this: like, mm-hmm. I am all for changing things up, redoing it, whatever. Yep. Just make it good. Just make it good. Make it yeah. worthwhile. Make me glad you changed a thing. Uh, because otherwise, if you're changing a thing to just change a thing, all you're doing is just doing that. So, yeah. yeah. Profound words of wisdom from Andrew Main. I know. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me, let me peek back. Uh, before we wrap things up, let me go to the Luma Dream Machine. Oh, doggone it. Uh, they have... We're 13 minutes in, and they have not yet encountered a patriotic celebration. Damn. Uh, maybe, maybe in after things. It's we'll in the talk, queue, though. We'll get it. 14 minutes. Uh, Brian. Yeah. Oh, you already did yours, and yeah. I did mine. Look at yeah. that. We made we, picks. We we did all of them. What happens next? Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, it's been weird. Nailed it. Uh, cool. Uh, do we want to go straight into after or? Yeah, let's go. Uh, okay. All right, ready, Andrew. I am ready. Three, two, one. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Bushwood. Oh, hey, hey. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hey, friends. So I did a talk earlier today for a group of startup founders. And the question I got was, how do you incorporate AI? How do you use it? And one of the things that I said was, take a look at every process that you're doing. And sometimes you don't need AI, you just need a better tool or to know how to use the tool in front of you. Then you can think about where you want to deploy AI. And often there are things that people say, use this, use that, and we ignore it. But then all of a sudden you jump into it, you go, wait, this is much better. Uh, For an example for me was using the cursor for writing code. I was using um, the... I was using, you know, VS Code, which had Copilot, which was pretty good. And then people told me that, um, that hey, you know what's better than that is Cursor. And I'm like, eh. And then I did it, and it just saved me so much more time because it's so much faster. Uh, re- real quick, just so I, I know who the characters are. Anytime I hear the word Copilot, has Microsoft successfully branded, like, anytime I hear Copilot, I can think of it's it's Microsoft's product? It's, it is it is ChatGPT's. Microsoft's version of ChatGPT. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, but, but but there's nobody else using that. That's not an open brand name. I'm I'm, I'm thinking in terms of like uh, whether or not it's a specific. Is it a proper noun or a common noun? Is what I'm asking. I don't know. I I think that they you know I think that it's there. Are other people are using versions of it, and Microsoft puts Copilot. It's every time they want to have something to be assistive AI, but other companies use the term Copilot too. Got it. Okay. All right. So, so it's still loosey goosey, but, but, uh, and what was the other thing that you mentioned? Well, cursor. Yeah. I mean, cursor is a tool, the, I, it, you know, um, uh, I, I think integrated that's, development environment. Yeah, yeah. That's the one that we did live on this very program, yeah. right? Where we tried it out and it was astonishingly good at, uh, it, it's programming, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
So yeah, that, and that was the thing, right? I think that, you know, in podcasting, like Justin, you use Riverside FM and I think you're having great success with that. You know, by no means is it a perfect tool, but for a lot of people trying to do a lot of different little things, sometimes yeah. it's worthwhile to say, hey, is there a smarter way to do this? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I would say uh, uh, the, the, the thing that I've been most impressed with Riverside is just how fast they've incorporated things. But I don't think that uh, uh, that means that they are the top of everything forever because that's the beauty of the world we're living in right now is that a lot of people are building a lot of really, really, really cool stuff really fast. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the top of the market is changing constantly, and it really benefits you as a consumer to keep your ear to the ground. Well, and, and to be honest, and maybe this will be kind of the topic we can gravitate around. Uh, I find myself, uh, I don't want to call it full on paralysis, but I find myself cautious about uh, like, I am currently switching this and streaming from a 2012 solution to the challenge of how to get the weird things podcast in front of everybody live as we record it. Uh, it uses too many computers and old equipment and all these things. And every time I feel the impulse to make a change, I encounter another article about another thing, uh, accelerating things. Uh, I, I guess that's my open-ended question to the panel is how does one know, or what are the, the guideposts one should rely on when it comes to figuring out when it's time to update because essentially the very act of updating means you're you're going to spend time to lock it in and then everything is going to get faster and easier past you uh and and right now I'm kind of getting annoyed at my paralysis uh of the fact that that I'm still waiting to decide when to go <laughs> Sounds like that's a good question. <laughs> no, I I I I it's I am so bad at deciding. I am really, really bad at figuring out when it's the time to use a new tool or when not to, you know, because because that is like you, said, you have this this built up knowledge of how a thing works and that fear of how a new thing will break or how it won't, you know, it's how it's not going to work for you. Um, and that's why I like to do test projects. I might try a thing, a different thing, and see if I can get it all the way through the same way instead of shifting everything completely into some new platform. Yes. Uh, so, so in other words, uh, hedge your bets and make uh, uh, incremental moves, or or create. I mean, it, uh, I, again, I was waiting for Justin to answer because he knows way more about the technology and stuff in front of what you're trying to do than I do. So, um, that that was the yeah. I mean, uh, uh, there. if if we want to do you specifically. I, I, I meant it open ended as, you know, how does one decide or but but if we want to talk about me specifically, I'd I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Uh, I think you specifically can you're running right now on three towers uh that you don't need two of them. Right. Uh you could you could get rid of two towers and reduce meaningfully your way that things can go wrong uh with an upgrade at you know for your camera solution yeah that that would be the atem that we talked about and that is something for which is i don't know it would depend we'd have to take a look at which model would actually work the best for you but uh that's something that is up you know top end a thousand dollars and two days worth of time away from just solving that problem permanently. Right. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I suppose the hesitation is the fact that if we're going to do that, then uh, like if we're going to make a bunch of changes, might as well make also changes. No, to... that's dumb. Stop it. Oh, Stop okay. it. That's right. a dumb, dumb way to think. Good. Dumb way to think. Uh, 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 Cause right now you're just overloading your brain. So you don't make a decision. Right. Uh, so either you want to solve this problem Okay. And you understand that it's a thousand dollars and two days worth of work for you to do it, and so therefore you're probably going to want to do it on it at, during a time where you don't have uh, you don't have stuff to do. So maybe we even move weird things uh, uh, to another day so you can pass. Uh, I, I can Tuesday have three night. whole days in a row. To... Yeah, like, like like past Tuesday night, you would yeah. have until Monday when you do cord killers to 
unplug everything and then do it. Because here's the reality. If in your head you're like, yeah, but then I should also move around the studio and I should also clean up the studio before I move it around. And also I should make sure that I clear out a lot of this tech clutter, blah, blah, blah. Yes, 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 yes. That's going to be the reason why you don't do anything. If you understand I got to solve one problem, guess what's going to happen? Once you actually get a uh, momentum on solving that you're way more likely to solve all these other problems that are just going to be excuses for you to not do the one thing yeah incremental progress is progress you shouldn't even call it incremental you should just call it getting a thing done getting one foot in front of the other uh, a big picture thinking is awesome when you want to have a big plan but it is paralysis when you assume that it is an actual daily agenda yep nope uh, uh you have uh the, uh, 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 three minutes ago, you won the argument. Uh, uh, I, I am here for it, and I think your solution is 100% correct. Uh, also, uh, Luma Labs uh, updated our uh, hey, <laughs> our movie. Let's go. Uh, so, so if, if you listen to the main show, you heard us uh, describe three podcasters running from goblins and spiders, and then we enhanced it by adding, and then uh, I wrote, uh, then they encounter a patriotic celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, here is uh, 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 we see we see the <laughs> goblins running. We have it, the clip begins with three podcasters running from uh, spider goblins, for lack of a better word, and then they stop and look up, and their version of a patriotic celebration is fairly caveman tribally. Would it be fair I, to I, say? I, yeah, it, it seems like 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 a, a, a little uh, a medieval village. Uh, uh, celebration. It's extraordinary. I can't believe that so few words were able to get close enough to the mark here with with this video. It's uh, it's it's amazing. Pretty incredible, like how fast it's come along. You know, we, yeah. you can see that the challenge it goes through, though, because of like kind of the coherence between characters. And I think I think that's going to be uh, take a little bit longer. For that to get to where people want it to, it's not something that's necessarily just a year away or whatever. But, and you look at this too, like this is heavily trained on Hollywood movies. Oh, like, yeah. Very, very heavily. And so um, that's what's kind of interesting to think of like, you know, how much of this are we going to find is there's probably like almost a one to one scene with very similar characters. Yeah. With, with, with like pacing, rhythm, uh, cinematography, uh, camera handling. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. And yeah. so, like, well, we, you know, we, we, uh, we would not be shocked if this was if we if we watch Brothers Grimm, <laughs> and, and would, this was like note similar, for note exactly yeah. that that thing, yeah. Well, but different, but I mean, like, like basically using you know we call style transfer using style transfer on top of clips, which yeah. I think is kind of what it's really the system is doing is it's looking for like kind of close matches in the embedding space. Mm. And then, I, I guess note for note wouldn't be the right phrase. Maybe maybe beat for beat, you know, like in terms of like yeah. this and then this and then this. Yeah. But still very impressive. I think that for a lot of shots, certain kind of things would be great. And if you can train them on your own stuff, even better. You know, I think about that is like if you go shoot a film and you put that, you, you train a special AI just on that film and you just like you can do now with adding an audio, you know, you can right now you can add a frame. If I'm missing a frame or a scratch frame, I can have AI fill it in. And then you might get to the point where you could have AI fill in a half a second. And then it's just, it's coming well, along. And, and I believe somebody told me that like scrubbing out watermarks on, you know, let's say I, I, this is something I'm really interested in is I stumbled across some of my old, you know, very first YouTube videos, the Brian Brushwood on the road stuff. And I'm wondering just how good upscaling upsampling is on that. And just how, just how quality I could take this garbage, you know, uh, I don't know, 16 or uh, I don't know, less than 8K audio and 320 by 240 visuals and see how much interpolation can happen on that. Audio can be great. Audio is great. We talked about before, like Adobe has that tool that you can use for podcast improving quality. So audio, audio up is really, really good. It can make stuff up, but there's such a predictability to audio that it works out well. Video upscaling, um, you can certainly do it. You know, it'll, it'll, if it's not too complex, if it, you know, if it's, if it's things that are easily understandable by an AI it's surfaces and textures, you'll, it'll probably do a good job. Yeah. Well, I, I, again, uh, this brings me back to choice paralysis where it's like, well, do I do it today or do I wait a month and have it be 10 times better? <laughs> 
Well, you're, you're better off with a thing that's well understood and not the thing that's the new, new thing. You know, you want to do the thing that's well understood. If it comes down to, you know, if your goal is, you know, you have to figure out what your best use of your time is, you know, is spending, you know, a week working on upscaling them and converting them worth it, you know, or is that week better spent on somewhere else, you know, give yourself a time budget and then figure out how to spend it. Yeah. I use this a lot too when I have a crazy idea that I want to go pursue. Oh, mm. again, we're back to the to the the timer. Timer. I held up a timer, everybody. Um, it's just is super useful. I'm like, oh, I have an idea. Okay, Andrew, you get 45 minutes, and if you can make it go somewhere, then fine. Uh, I, I I know we're supposed to wrap up, but it's like, man, I find myself engaged in so much conversational thinking with myself where like I get up and I'm like, okay, what are we doing? Like, like for example, that moment that you find yourself with an open refrigerator and it's one in the morning and you ask yourself, so we're doing this. We're, we're, we're going to eat in the middle of the night. And it's like, well, no, I just, it was like, okay, no, 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 that's fine. It's just like, tell you what, you can have that ham, but I'm going to have, I'm going to make you set an alarm. We're going to go to the gym. Oh, I don't want to. It's like, well then decide my guy, myself, you know, what are we doing here? Um, and that if- I, I'm looking at Brian, looking at his golem like reflection in the mirror of the refrigerator. <laughs> you know, I want this ham zizis. Well, if you want the ham zizis, accurate. But but my my point being that uh, I find myself engaged in a lot of what I think of as if then thinking, where it's like mm-hmm. take take the decision out of my hand. Like uh, what you do, just described as a situation where it's like, yeah, okay, you want to chase this whimsy? Great, go for it. But the moment this dings, you're done. And it's like, okay, me, I agree. And then off you go. And then it dings. And you're like, oh, that's right. I made an agreement with myself. And we're done. I, I, yeah. I also think it goes back to the momentum concept of, of like, you know, the, the timer is not just important for the ding. The timer is important because it is a reason that you are focusing on this right now. And you can in the process of giving it your full attention, make a more realistic decision on what is this problem? How much do I have to deal with it? What is my learning curve on it? And those are the things that are all lost in the magical visionary thinking of like, oh, I would love to do blank like Brian. I'd like to upscale my old videos so I can repost them and and introduce them or find new ways that I can repackage them. Cool. Fun, visionary ideas for which you are assuming you understand what you are going to do with a final product. Ignoring all the steps of how do we get from here to there. Whether or not they are easy, whether or not they are hard. And so when you get into a process, you're going to hit these, uh, uh, if you just wander into it, if you just wade into the quicksand without paying attention, you're going to find that there are hurdles that will lead to problems that'll lead to discouragement that'll lead to you either screwing around or doing something else and next thing you know you're in a quagmire where if it's a 40 minute timer at least you know okay here's here's what i'm doing and if at the end of that 40 minutes you only have a sense of what problems you have the time you're going to spend thinking about it will be about the problems and how to get the solutions as opposed to the time that you spent doing a thing and whether or not you're second guessing yourself and whether or not you should have done it yeah. Picks. Yeah, I got an anti pick. I I I I do bad picks in after things. I'm an evil pick man. Uh, uh, I love Renaissance <laughs> fairs. All right. <laughs> Ain't no secret. I met Andrew because we were both in a Renaissance Recreation Society in uh, South Plantation High School. I like Renaissance fairs. I liked them when I was a kid. I enjoy them now, although I haven't been to one in a very long time. So I watched on HBO Max a documentary series called Ren Fair. And I'm like, what a great, rich place where you could do an amazing documentary. Uh, it stinks <laughs> on ice. It's terrible. It's way overshot. And so maybe I'm I might be poisoned because I've been around television production. I've been around shooting things uh, that uh, uh, you know you just know when something's real and when it's shot and recreated. It's it's a drama to the point where at certain points it like even 
puts in characters that are invented for the story. Uh, uh, it's just so overindulgent in terms of how they shot it that I didn't find any of the drama compelling. Uh, when this is a rich place, literally, just throw a camera crew into the the lives of these weird carnies, and and this is all centered around the Texas Renaissance Festival, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, in the in in the country. You have the the progenitor of this is an eccentric old man. Uh, King George, and you have a weird little succession plot that, again, I don't believe because everything is shot so slickly that it's like, okay, well, I don't care about this drama. You want to do a a, a a fake show? If you want to do a written show, a drama about it, then do a drama. But if you want to do a documentary, I have to feel like it's real with the caveat that, yes, things are reshot in documentaries and sometimes things are recreated. But at least give me the illusion that what you are doing is real. I lost total track of time. I lost total track of the stakes. And the actual conflict moves at such a glacial pace that, uh, uh, I mean, I, did, I, I did, was so turned out by, I was so turned off by it by the end. Did did you finish it? Because last time we talked, you were midway through it. No, we finished it. And I fell asleep in the last 10 minutes and I couldn't be happier. It was my do, favorite do, part do, of the series. Do you still want me to watch it so I can hate talk about it with you? I, You know what? Before I was like, oh, it'll be interesting. I mean, you should watch it because you've actually been to the Texas Renaissance Fair. That, so, that like, exact that's, Ren Fair, that, yeah. It is, it is very interesting. It's beautiful. It looks great. In fact, I would say it is lesser because it was so concentrated on looking good. It was so concentrated on the filigree around where, you know, there's this one scene where uh, uh, George, the King George, is talking about how he wants to remodel his bathroom. And he's discussing Rococo art about how it it is art for art's sake and, and every little inch is covered with something that's fancy that's what this series is, and guess what? What's great for the man's uh, 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 totems in his in his bathroom was not great for three hours uh, or three uh, 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 episodes on HBO Max. Yeah, I feel like the problem is a lot of documentaries, they feel like they have to fit a specific format, and in doing that, they will take a story that has its own life and fit it into something else, and then you kind of get the cliche too, like, we went to do this, then this happens. We made it about that. And it's like, you know, it's like why well, I love documentary now. Like it just deconstructs documentaries so well that it makes it hard to watch them, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would just say if you just shot it like Bar Rescue, you'd get a better doc because yeah. Ren Fair people don't need crazy stuff on top of it. They're psychotic hippie carnies with who no go filter. from town to town with no filter. Like, well, let them go. What well, big problem is this is that you're getting you're getting a lot of docs now coming from people who I don't know about the producers of here. I did see the Safety brother, Safety, at least one of them was involved. But you're getting people coming from the role of film and TV narrative who yeah. decide to do docs because they like the low budgets. But the thing that makes docs work, really good docs work, is time, is the idea that you you spend seven months, eight months a year with your subjects are going around and in, in, in collecting information. And so you get people now coming in who are like, we have a great setup. We have a great location. We'll just make a story happen yes. in 12 shooting days. And that's where you get things that are forced and fake and whatnot because they're not really embedded. They're not waiting for the story. They're just they're just going to push people into scenes. And, you know, I watched like I, you know, I was, my wife was watching something about some cult thing. And I looked at this. These people are at a table having a conversation. I'm like. This is all fake. Yeah. Like, this was recorded long after because they wanted a thing to tie it together. Yet they're all presenting that this is in, in moment like, oh, we have to do this. And you could tell by the way everybody was just waiting for their line. It was, and I, I couldn't it couldn't watch this because I said, this is such a fake documentary that you can't even be honest with me about when a thing you created a scene to tell your story. Why should I believe you about anything? Yeah, Andrew, I was thinking the same thing. Killed it. Me too. Well, Brian, we've got to take an account that if they find out that we're recording them, then that could be a problem. We we should have another pick. Uh, you have a pick, Andrew. Yes, that's right. I have a pick. And my pick is... 
my my picks Godzilla minus one. <laughs> is it, is it good? I heard it oh, was loved good. It. Loved it. Loved it. Again, go and expect fifteen million dollar Godzilla movie with really good characters and a really cool reimagining of the origin. Right on. Uh, I actually uh, my pick is the new Jonathan Rauch book, The Happiness Curve. That talks about uh, spoiler alert. I'm getting ready to turn 50 years old, and uh, Jonathan Rausch, who wrote Kindly Inquisitors and uh, another book I can't remember right now, uh, he uh, wrote a book about um, how uh, scientists have figured out that uh, everything from orcas to orangutans to humans seem to have a second puberty that is. Uh, jokingly referred to as a midlife crisis, although that he explains that that's not a really good or useful way to phrase it. He says it's more like a middle-aged malaise as you get ready for the second act of your life. And, uh, you know, he talks about, uh, quite frankly and directly, the body changes that we all go through and the societal changes that we all go through. It was astonishing. I really, really liked it a lot. If you don't want to listen to the audiobook, then maybe listen to the hour-long interview that our friend Andrew Heaton does with Jonathan Rausch over at the Political Orphanage, uh, because that alone, pretty much, that's what got me to read the book. And then reading the book, I'm like, this is a great book. I went back and re-listened to the interview. Uh, there, there are some. There's a lot of interesting, surprising facts. For uh, yeah, uh, the happiness curve. That's my pick. Nice. Well, gentlemen, <laughs> it's been after. That was the sound of my 3D printed switchblade. That's all right. I'm switching it over to the movie right now. All right, bye. Got it. That movie looks dope. I'd watch that movie about our show. Yeah. Accurate. It's a documentary. <laughs> Look at us. We're at, we're at a rent fair. <laughs> Oh my God! That movie, that, that series sucked. <laughs> okay. Sucked. All right. God, All right. did it suck? Anna Lisa <laughs> knows it sucks. Yeah, yeah, she does. All right, here I'm, I'm going to wind us down. All right, we love you guys. Thank you, weirdos. Bye. <laughs>